worship God today in this place hallelujah God we love you this day God we worship you Lord thank you Lord hallelujah God we worship you this day God glory to your name God hallelujah 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 he is indeed great and I am thankful for that today if you would let's go to our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter number two Genesis chapter number two is where we're going to be beginning I do apologize that I just slipped in here about 10 minutes ago. I have been in a, a seminar that I had to attend today. I have to actually go back tomorrow as well. And uh, it took me that long to get here. I uh, was very thankful as I was driving up today, uh, looking across the interstate, seeing the traffic backed up because of an accident that I had just passed. I was thankful that it was on that side of the interstate and not on the side I was on or I probably would not have made it at all. So. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, is my cell phone is also dead, and so there was no way for me to contact anyone. So that would have really made everything interesting. But uh, thankfully, that was not the case. Genesis chapter 2, and beginning with verse number 15, also thankful that uh, my wife uh, and four kids are with me tonight. Glad that, actually, not with me. They met me here, I should say. They beat me here. And so thankful that they are able to make it tonight and be with me. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse number 15. The Lord God and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof Thou shalt surely die. Now that was what God said. But then Genesis chapter 3 beginning with verse number 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Of course, we've heard this preached before. He's questioning Eve. What did God really say? You can't eat of any of the trees of the garden or of every tree of the garden. It's kind of unsure exactly according to the translation, exactly the way that that was intended to be uh, implied. But the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Understand. Eve knew exactly what God had said. She interpreted it exactly the way he had spoken it in Genesis chapter 2. She knew what God had said. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And here is where the problem came in. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. In verse 3, Eve herself made the statement, God hath said but in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 it says the woman saw I want to preach tonight for a few moments of time on a subject that I only saw about 12 hours ago or so maybe less than that 
And it is simply this. The way I see it versus the way God said it. The way I see it versus the way God said it. See, I, I hear so many people today say, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. That's the problem. You got the wrong focus. It's not about what you see. It's about what God said. And just because you see it differently doesn't make it so. Contrary to what somebody heard, uh, I heard say this week, that is as confused as they can come, there is an absolute truth. And it doesn't matter whether or not you see it that way. That is a fact. I don't care what you want to say. It is not raining out there. It's not raining out there. And I don't care what your opinion is. It's hot out there. That is absolutely fact. I don't care how you see it. And that's exactly the way the Word of God is. It doesn't matter the way you see it. If God said it, that's it. There is no argument. There is no argument. So let's pray right now and ask that God would speak to us right now in this place. Heavenly Father, we need you today, God. I'm praying right now for the anointing of the power of the Holy Ghost to descend in this place. I'm asking that your spirit would work right now in a mighty way, God. Let the power of the Holy Ghost work in our midst, God. We need you today, oh God. And we're trusting that your spirit's going to work right now, God. Not only, oh Lord, for us to feel or to hear what you've got, but Lord, for us to respond in the way that you want us to. Thank you, God, for what you're about to do. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. The way I see it versus the way God said it. Just a few weeks ago, right here in this very room, right from this very pulpit, our youth president from the District of Tennessee, Brother Wesley Stevens reminded us of some things that God said. And I'm just going to briefly go through a little bit of this. And to be honest with you, I started writing these notes and then realized he had preached that part of it here a few weeks ago. Uh, and that was totally after what God had shown me out of Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. But I want to I go over a little bit of what he was saying here a few weeks ago. Genesis chapter 1 and beginning with verse number 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. When God said it, it happened. Verse number 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. God said it, and it happened. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Beginning with verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Beginning with verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly that hath life, excuse me, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. It happened. And then we have last but not least, verse number 24, where, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. When God spoke in Genesis chapter 1, it happened. We see this demonstrated time upon time in the scriptures. We see everything that happened. When God spoke, uh, things happened. Psalm 33 and verse number 6 reminds us that it was by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. God spoke things into existence. When God stated something to be a fact, he spoke it into existence. When he spoke something to be real, it took place. When God made his command, things took place. 
That's why when we come to the New Testament, uh, there is such a remarkable following of Jesus. Uh, you see, so many people look at Jesus and they say, you know, he had such a power. And we think of the word power differently than I think the New Testament church believed the word power. And the reason that I believe this is there is one particular story of a man whose son, uh, whose servant, excuse me, was sick. Uh, and it looked like he was going to die. And he sent, j- sent some servants to Jesus. Uh, and he said, I want you to go and tell them about my servant. But he kind of had second thoughts, apparently, because as Jesus is coming, the man goes and meets Jesus. And it just so happened he was a centurion. He was one who had soldiers under his authority. And the Bible tells us that this man meets Jesus, and and he says, Look, God, I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. And I'm paraphrasing. He said, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but if you will speak the word only, my servant shall be healed. Now, we've always thought that's just incredible power on God's part, and we were right we just didn't know what we were saying we think that oh God had some kind of magical spell that he would cast upon things but it wasn't that at all because this man said for I also am a man under authority I tell one go and he goes I tell another come and he comes do this and they do it go there and they go he said when I make a command they know they don't have a choice but to obey It wasn't a magical spell that caused them just to shrink back because they were fighting against it and couldn't do it. No, it was the fact that those uh, powers and those things that were around him, those sicknesses, had no choice but to obey him. Why do we know this? Because Jesus turns around and said, you know what, I want you to look at this guy because I have not seen such great faith in all Israel. It was as if Jesus was saying, I have not found anyone that understood it any better than this man understands it. He understands it's not a magical spell it's not some magic potion but rather it's the understanding that there is divine authority that it cannot disobey because when God speaks it it has to happen what is so interesting is that in Mark chapter 11 in verse number 23 Jesus was tell, was talking to uh, the to, to Peter and perhaps the rest of his disciples. It was to the rest of his disciples because they had come by. And when he saw the fig tree that wasn't producing, he said, you know what? Just forget about ever being productive again since you don't have what you're supposed to have. And they come by and they're all amazed because it's done shriveled up and died. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. This is in Mark 11 verse 21. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, I don't know all the ramifications. I don't know all of the things that that go into this. But in some way, in some some minuscule way and with certain ramifications, God basically said, listen, disciples, you've got the ability and the authority to make the same commands that I have made and those things have to obey. It's because of the power that is invested inside of us. The authority that is embodied in the Holy Ghost that's on the inside of us. That those things have no choice but to obey. There are times we put up with things we shouldn't be putting up with because we've got the authority to tell them to go. But ultimately, the point I want to make today is that when God says something, it's truth. It's true that we may ha- we have some, some authority. It's true that we have the authority to speak to some things and they can happen. And that's a message all in and of itself. And I've preached it. But tonight I just want to simply establish the fact, first of all, that God speaks truth. As a matter of fact, it is impossible, as the Bible tells us, for God to lie it's not physically possible now as honest as I hope that every one of us in this room are we are not outside the possibility of slipping up and telling something that's just not quite true but it is impossible for God to lie so when God speaks it it is truth 
As a matter of fact, Jesus in John chapter 17 and verse number 17, when he is praying as the flesh to the spirit, he makes the prayer about his disciples, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. When God speaks it, there is no question about it. It is true. When God says it, there is no possibility that there is even a lie. When God makes a statement, you can take it to the bank. It is a fact because God's word is true. Psalms 19, beginning with verse number 7, tells us that the law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect. The thing that we dream of. And as a matter of fact, we are even challenged and instructed to be perfect in the book of 1 Peter. But the law, the commandment of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. That's one reason it has such a power. That's one reason that it is able to convert our souls is because God's word is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, no question about it, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. His commands, his laws, they are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. What powerful words about the word of God. Psalm 33 in verse number 4 tells us, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. I tell you today, That if God speaks something, it is truth. It is so true that it need not be questioned for accuracy. It need not be questioned for accuracy. That does not mean there does not come times in our minds that we do not question God. But when we question God, it should simply be with the purpose of saying, God, I'm questioning you simply because I don't understand it. But our faith says, even though I don't understand it, I know that God's got a plan and God knows what he's doing. Now, there are times when we wonder, deep down, God, what's going on? What is happening? And we sometimes feel like things get out of control in those moments of weak faith. But ultimately, we come back to the point and realize, God, even though it seems out of my control, it's never out of your control. Job reminded us, I look to the right hand and I can't find him. I look to the left, I can't find him. Up, down, everywhere, the depths of the earth, up to the tops of the sky, I can't find God. But he said, even though I can't find God, the Lord knoweth the way that I take. Even though I don't know where he's at, God knows where I am. And so what God speaks is true. And when God spoke it in Genesis chapter 2 to Adam, there was no question about what truth was. This was not just something that God preferred. This was not just God speaking about his preferences. This was God stating a fact when he said in Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 and 17, of every tree of the garden... Thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There was no question about what God meant by that. Adam and Eve knew exactly, and Eve was not even in existence. She was not even in the picture at this point. But Adam knew absolutely for certain What it was that God wanted him to do. As a matter of fact, it may very well be 
Adam's own fault that the temptation ever came to Eve and didn't have to go, go through him. Because verse number 15 tells us that the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. To take care of it. But one of those words, and I honestly, I, I can't remember which one it is. But one of those words in the original Hebrew language, if my memory serves me correctly, actually means to build a hedge or to place something that was a protection around the Garden of Eden. Adam was supposed to be the protector of the garden. Adam was supposed to be keeping out the things that didn't belong there. Could that have also included the serpent himself? Could it have included, at the very least, the, the, uh, the enemy of their souls, Satan, in the form of the serpent? If Adam had been on the job, and we don't know, maybe he didn't fail, but maybe, just maybe, Adam failed in his job as the protector of what was supposed to be taking place. The protector of his home of Eden. Now that is, it is true. Number one, that men in the house, we do have a job to protect our homes and to keep out what we do not need in our homes. But let us also understand that every single one of us in this room have a responsibility to make sure that the enemy of our souls does not find some kind of a crack or a crevice to be able to slip into just in the slightest way to be able to tempt us and begin to work on us as well. But when we arrive at Genesis chapter 3, it wasn't just the introduction of a question that caused Eve to fail. Because we open the chapter with it describing the serpent and him speaking to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. It almost appears, at least from the way the King James Version translates, as if Satan was trying to say to Eve, God doesn't let you do anything, does he? He didn't just say the one tree, but it's as if he says, God doesn't let you eat any of these trees in here, does he? And you know, sometimes that's what the enemy, sometimes in the form of people, will tell us as well. You all can't do anything when you live for God, can you? There's absolutely nothing. You can't enjoy life. You can't do this. You can't do that. It's a punishment. It's a drudgery to do what you're doing. Absolutely not. That is not what God has said. And the things that he has kept us from, the same people that will tell us about that will not tell us about how that their life has been racked by all the sorts of things that they claim to have enjoyed. And all the things that they claim that we've been kept from. Well, if that is the case, thank God for it. That's exactly why God said, don't do it. But no, God has not kept us from every pleasure and enjoyment. But that's exactly the way the enemy would like to turn that and twist that. He would like for us to think, not just them, but he would like for us to begin to think, you can't do anything when you live for God. But that is the trick of the enemy. And that was one of the things that started the temptation the very first time. If you think that the enemy used it the first time, don't you think that in 2018 he's not still up to the same thing? As a matter of fact, I believe it was the Apostle Paul that told us that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. The reason is because he's using the same tricks today that he was using back then. Oh, he may change their form. He may change their shape. He may change their presentation. But it's still the same old devices that he used at the beginning. It's the same old tricks that that he used back then and he's still trying to siphon us off today but the question was not the problem because Eve still got the answer right for all 
of the things that we con condemn about Eve and all the things that we criticize her and Adam for, I do applaud Eve for correcting the serpent in verses 2 and 3 when she said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The problem was not the question. And so the serpent just says, look, I'm just going to go ahead and outright contradict God and say that you shall not surely die. And the reason God's saying this is because he knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God's, knowing good and evil. You're going to have your eyes open. You're going to see some things. You're living such a sheltered life living for God. You need to be able to experience some things. Why is it that some of you that never tried it out, and believe me, I hear this all the time with the people I work with every single day, why is it that, that you never, you don't know what you're missing? You're exactly right. I'm not missing all the heartache that you experience. I'm not missing all the disappointments that you've experienced. And they sit there and describe it in the same room. But that's the enemy that will try to play that trick. But that still wasn't the problem. The problem was Eve herself. Because the Bible says it was when she saw that the tree was good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. It was when Eve got a revelation. That contradicted the word of God. That she said, oh, it can't be all that bad. i got to have some of this. Because she got a revelation. Ooh, that tree is good for food. Ooh, it is pleasant to the eyes. Yes, it's a tree that I desire because I want to be wise. i got to have some of that. It was when Eve got a so-called revelation that she finally chose to go the route and introduce sin into the world. She saw that the tree was good for food. She saw that it looked appealing to her flesh. She saw that it looked appealing, that she just needed to get something. Even though she knew deep down she wasn't but just a couple of verses removed, just a few minutes away from having told Satan herself, yes, I know for a fact, he said, don't eat of the tree. But as Satan is talking to her about what it's really going to do, she begins to see, oh man, yeah, this does look good. The revelation that Eve received is what caused her to say, you know, maybe I don't see anything wrong with it. Maybe there really isn't anything to that. Maybe there's really not a problem with that. I know what's been preached. I know what's been said. I know what the Word of God says, but I've got a revelation. I don't see it. I don't feel like there's really anything wrong with that. That's, that's just not the way I think. We've just got a difference of opinion. If the Word of God says one thing, and you use the phrase, I think this, you've already got a problem. One of the scariest statements is when it is a part of a conjunctive sentence, and the words, but I think, follows, the Word of God says this. Because if you ever hear a statement that the Word of God says this, but I think that thinking will get you into big trouble. As a matter of fact, the book of Judges concludes by telling us that in those days there wasn't a judge in Israel. Every man just did 
what they thought was right. And as a result, we start seeing all kinds of trouble. Even the priest wouldn't, wouldn't correct his sons, was letting full-blown sin take place right at the entryway of the house of God. Because every man just did what they thought was right. They didn't have a judge. They didn't have anybody to tell them what was right from wrong. They just did what they thought was right. The way I see it, the way I feel it, the way I think, had better not contradict what God has already said. Because it doesn't matter the way I see it. If God says it differently. The book of Psalms that I read to you just a few moments ago, or actually said for you just a few months ago in Psalms chapter 19, is followed by some very interesting verses that I'm not sure that I have ever quite seen like I did today. Psalms 19, and beginning with verse number 10. I said a moment ago, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Yes, God is right in what he says. But then verse 10 goes on to say, goes on to say more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Before you even desire what you want to eat, before you even desire wealth, you need to understand that what God says should be tre treasured even much more than that because of, because of the ramifications that follow the obedience or disobedience to the word of God. Verse number 11 says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. What happened to Adam and Eve? They were told, you can eat of any of the trees in the garden, but of that one in the middle of the garden, thou shalt not eat. By God's word, we are warned. But then he contrasts that and he says, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. The psalmist even goes on to say, who can understand his errors? You know, a lot of times, we don't see what's wrong with us. We don't see what we're doing wrong. We don't have the revelation of what's wrong with us. And what's funny is, is everybody else around us can see it. But we can't. And so the psalmist, in, in saying all this about the, the word of God and its value, he said, in exasperation, who can understand his errors? And he turns to God and says, cleanse thou me from secret faults. He said, I know what you say is right. I know that what you command is true. Everything that you say is the way it's supposed to be. But I, I just, you know, I'm exasperated, God. How can I ever understand truly all the error of my ways. How am I going to get it all right? Cleanse me from those secret faults. In Psalm number 17, and beginning with verse number 4, the Bible tells us, Concerning the works of men by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. In other words, the psalmist understands by hearing what God has to say and doing what he instructs. And he does not condition it with, do I understand it or do I see it that way or do I agree with it? But if God says it and I obey it, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. You know, today we hear a lot about the importance of prayer. We hear a lot about the importance of reading our Bibles. But there is something we don't hear a lot about. We hear about reading our Bibles. But we hear very little preaching and instruction about the outright memorization of the Word of God. 
Now, most many of you in this room know exactly how I feel about that. In my work with both of the Bible quiz ministries in Tennessee, I, I am gone twice a month with this. Next month, I plan to travel to the national tournament for senior Bible quizzing and already making plans for next year because I believe in its importance. And I've always believed in the importance of the memorization of the Word of God and hiding God's Word in our heart. But I saw something this year that I don't think I've ever seen before. The psalmist put some pretty specific and sincere ramifications about why we're to memorize the Word of God. And it's in a verse that many of us have heard all our lives. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. Wait a minute. This is not just so I'll be closer to God. This is not just so I can hear God speak when he said, No, he said, I'm memorizing the word so I won't fall into sin. Now, wait a minute. With all the other fences that we respect and all of the other boundaries that we acknowledge, why is it that we are not building fences in our own hearts and our own minds by the memorization of the word of God? Because the psalmist said the way we're going to protect ourselves from sin is by outright putting the word of God in our hearts. You cannot get the word of God in your heart if it is not first in your mind. And so, the word of God, what it actually says, not just what we perceive it to say there's a number of people today as I've already said that will say I don't see it that way but if that's what it says that's what it says it's not a matter of how I see it or how you see it it's about what God meant when he said it I've got several parents in here today you don't really care if your child sees it that way when you say it I know I don't I mean what I said, and I don't leave it up for interpretation. I wonder sometimes if God is thinking the same thing. Because 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 tells us, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Sometimes when, God, when someone says that they don't see it a particular way, I wonder if sometimes God's saying, look, it ain't a matter about how you see it. This is what I meant when I said it. And so instead of just agreeing to disagree, and I'm not suggesting us be argumentative when it comes to the Scriptures, by all means, at some point, you're going to have to leave it be and say, you know what, God's going to have to reveal it to them. You speak your peace in a kind manner and in love. Speak the truth in love. But at the same time, you have to allow them to come to that revelation on their own. And you have to pray that God will reveal it to them. But you know what? While you're praying it for them, you better be praying it for yourself as well. Because sometimes we get so caught up in praying, Oh God, reveal truth to them. But at the same time, what if there is a spirit that I've got or there is something inside of me that's not what it needs to be that I'm displaying that everybody else can see but I can't see it because I'm too busy praying for the revelation of truth to everybody else. It's not about the way I see it. It's about the way God said it. And so when we stop and we see a scripture and we feel like we've got it all figured out, we need to ask God and say, you know what? I need to make sure this is what you meant when you said this. Is this what you were saying? When we struggle to understand something, because it attacks a certain part of us. I'm, I'm going to go even a little bit further. If from time to time the Word of God does not challenge you in some way, your, your spiritual life may be dead. If the Word of God does not strike you at times and convict you about something from time to time, you need to pray that God wakes you up. 
Because that's the purpose of the Word of God. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God. It's not left up for interpretation. It's very specific. When God gave his instructions about salvation, he was very clear. The Bible tells us that in Acts chapter 2, after the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost fell, Peter is preaching and he first addresses the phenomenon because they were being accused of being drunk. And he said, look, you know, that's not even possible. It's just the third hour of the day. It's just 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk like you think we are. But then he goes on and he says, but rather this is the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 29. He quotes it in Acts 2, 16 and 17 and even into verses 18 and 19 I think are some of the verses following that in Joel 2. And then he goes, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now we've got friends in this world today that will tell us that is a plan of salvation. Because they quote a very similar verse from Romans chapter 10. But why is it that we do not read immediately about the crowd that Peter was preaching to falling upon their knees and crying out to God because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we do not read that. As a matter of fact, Peter didn't stop preaching. He just keeps going. And he begins to preach conviction down because he begins to talk about the cross. He begins to talk about how that Jesus is the one that was the Messiah that they had long awaited for. And he said, and look, you guys took him to the cross. It was your fault that he went to the cross because you made Pilate send him to the cross. And he concludes his message up in verse number 36 saying, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, that was the Messiah that you killed. And verse number 37 tells us, When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted. And said unto Peter and to the, and, uh, to the other apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Stop there. If Acts 2.21 was a plan of salvation, why did the crowd feel the need to ask, what do we do? If Romans 10.13 that says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, why did the audience in Acts 2 not understand that as a plan of salvation? I'll tell you why. It's because the emphasis was not on call, but rather on whosoever. He was trying to tell them that anybody that calls on God can be saved. But his audience understood that wasn't a plan. That's not what we do to be saved. And so they asked Peter, what do we do? And that's when Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There are many in our world today that are saying, well, I don't see it that way. But that's what God said. That's what the Word of God says. Peter was given the keys of the kingdom by Jesus himself. Keys are what unlock the doors. Keys are what is going to allow you inside. So if you want to get on the inside of the kingdom, find the person with the keys. And Peter unveiled those keys in Acts chapter 2 when he told them what they had to do to be saved. And then he just said it wasn't just for this generation. He said in verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Even if you don't see it that way. I'm not trying to be rude today, but I want you to hear me today. It's not about what you see. It's not about what you think. It's not about the way you feel. It's about what God said to be fact. And so beware of the temptation to be satisfied in your revelation. Because if your revelation does not work in tandem with the word of God, it is false. And it is very tempting sometimes to think, but this revelation just seems so incredible. 
It just seems so wonderful. Notice Paul's caution in the book of Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 8 when he said, but though we are an angel from heaven. He said, even if it seems like some supernatural being has appeared out of the sky, even if they preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul said, I don't care how incredible that revelation is. I don't care how angelic that being seems to be. If he's preaching a gospel that's different than what we've preached to you, if it's different than what the word of God says, you need to let that be cursed. You need to reject that. You need to say there's not truth in that. I'm going to reject it. I'm going to leave that behind. I'm going to dismiss that. I'm going to go with what God said to be true. And if you think an angel from heaven is going to be something, the Bible tells us that in the end time, there's going to come signs and wonders that are going to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. They're going to be so supernatural, so incredible, so godlike that if we are not careful, we can fall away too. As a matter of fact, the false prophet that is supposed to work in tandem with the Antichrist is going to call down fire from heaven. Oh, I can hear the statements in that day. Man, he did just what Elijah did. He did just what the prophet of God did. And how many people are going to follow the supernatural? But if it does not work in the way the word of God says it's to work, we are to reject it. It's not about what I feel. It's not about the way I see it. It's about the way God said it. You see, faith, everybody oversimplifies faith. Number one, I love it how that our world today talks about faith and how that it is so just some kind of a mental ascent and how that it is just where, well, I believe that's faith and how that I can just Step up and just acknowledge Jesus, and that's, that's faith. It's, it's not by works. Wait a minute. Number one, as you know, the scripture in James chapter 2, the Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. But not only that, if I was to point you to one chapter in the Bible about faith, where would you expect me to take you? That's not a rhetorical question. Where would you expect me to take you in the Bible if I was going to tell you about faith? Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Last I checked, that's an action verb. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So it does include mental ascent. But let's keep going. By faith, Abel offered. That's action. By faith, Enoch was translated. A little bit passive, but somewhat action. Verse 7. By faith, being warned of God of things not... By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. By the which he condemned the world and became heir. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, should afterward receive an inheritance, obeyed. Oh, I thought faith was without works. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Verse 9, by faith he sojourned, dwelling in tabernacles. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered... Any woman think that that's passive? Highly doubt that. There's a lot of action that takes place there of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful. That was promised. Verse 11, these all died in faith. Wow. But they were persuaded of them and embraced them and con that they were strangers and pilgrims. 
Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up. All in the same thought of verse 17. Verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Verse 21, by faith Jacob blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Verse 22, by faith Joseph made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. The action on the part of Moses' parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Verse 24, by faith Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt verse 27 by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. By faith, verse 29, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Action again. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. When she had received the spies with peace. And then, after just seemingly getting exhausted, naming all the people, not literally exhausted. But then he goes in verse 32 and says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me. All this faith that these people say that they've got and they can't ever produce a work. Preacher in Hebrews chapter 11 says, I've run out of time because I can't tell you about Gideon and Barak and of Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection action that took place by faith in order to show that you really got faith there's got to be action the very chapter that many would even dub the hall of faith the one that when I asked you tonight, if I was going to take one chapter and talk to you about faith, it was immediately answered by someone. Because you know what chapter is synonymous with the subject of faith, and it is full of people who by faith took action. It's because we understand that when God said faith, he meant action. Now, a lot of people today say, I don't see it that way. I, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't feel like that's the case. That's just not what I think. But it's the way God said it. As they come back to music and we stand right now, I want to give us the opportunity to come around the altar here in just a moment and to ask God, Lord, when you speak, it's truth. It's truth. Have we ever struggled with what God said? Absolutely. Abraham struggled too. Abraham, what's interesting, the Bible says he staggered not at the promise of God. What really intrigues me about that is because when I think of the word stagger, I think of, I get the image of a drunk who stumbles and by that very different definition, and please don't lose me here, but by that very different definition, Abraham did stagger. Let's just be honest. You go back to the scriptures and you look in the Old Testament. The reason Hagar even became a possibility is because Abraham got to struggling a little bit in his faith and said, you know, Sarah might just be right. Maybe God's just going to give me a 
a seed through me, but it's not going to necessarily going to be through Sarah. And so there was the additional marriage and the birth of Hagar, which to this day is still causing Israel trouble in the form of the Arabs, the Palestinians. But Abraham struggled in his faith there. Twice Abraham lied to keep from dying because he was afraid they were going to kill him when he already had a promise that he was going to be a great nation. Right. Now, in the definition that you and I use for stagger, Abraham staggered all over the place. But it wasn't God's definition of stagger. Because when you look at the original word that's translated as staggered in that book, in that, cha- in that verse, it's in, I believe it's in Romans chapter 4, maybe verse number 20, somewhere in there. The word stagger there literally means to cut yourself off from. It indicates absolute, complete rejection, saying there is absolutely no possible way God could do it. Now, I don't ever read Abraham doing that. Abraham struggled. And there were times when he kind of felt like, maybe I need to do something here, and I don't understand. And in his struggle to believe it, he wonders, man, what am I supposed to do here? What what, what can I do? He, He staggered in that respect. But he never cut himself off from the promise. And at the same time, when we read about the 12 spies that came back from Canaan, the Bible tells us that those 12 spies, when they came back, 10 of them brought back an evil report. Joshua and Caleb standing there saying, oh, we're well able to take the land. God has promised it. We're going to take it. When God says that you can believe it, we're taking it to the bank. God's got, it. God's got this thing for us. He's going to give us the victory. And look at the grapes we're going to take advantage of. But the other ten spies kept on and kept on and kept on producing the evil report. And a lot of people just believe it's because those ten spies produced that evil report. But that's not exactly what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, if you look at the next chapter in the book of Numbers, and you read on, the debate's going back and forth between the ten spies and the two spies. But then the Bible says, and hear me closely, and I can't remember if it was just the spies, but I believe it was all the people, picked up stones to stone Joshua and Caleb. You see, what they were just about to do, and really in their hearts had already done, was saying, we are so convinced we can't have the victory that God's promised that we're going to silence the voice that says it can happen. It was an absolute rejection. It was not just a struggle. This wasn't just an accidental struggle in faith and and, and the normal human feelings that we go through on a regular basis. It was an absolute rejection that, that when the voice of God through Joshua and Caleb was speaking and saying, we're going to be victorious, they picked up stones and said, we're not going to hear that again. And that's when God said, those 20 and upward, you were right. You're not going in the promised land. You see, God considers staggering when you tell Him what you said. It's not just your struggle with trying to decide, is that really what God said or is it not? Look, God understands in 2018 with all the beliefs that are out there and I probably have heard more than anybody in this room. I heard some new ones this year. The setting that I'm in there in the prison system, I wouldn't believe what some of these people believe. New stuff that I'm hearing all along about what people, I can understand why people struggle to find out what the truth really is. I understand why people are so exasperated with truth and why they can't seem to find what it is. And God doesn't necessarily have a problem with that struggle. But God does have a problem with when He speaks something and you say, I refuse to hear it. If you say, God, you said that, but I see it this way and I'm sticking with it and I'm going to reject that, you got a problem. It's not about what you see. But if you can be open enough today that in your struggle, to see what God has said. If you can be honest with God today and say, God, I hear what He's saying. 
And I'm starting to sense a little bit of revelation. I'm still struggling with my unbelief. There's another passage, and, I, and I'll close with this. But I'm, I'm just continuously, just things are coming to me that, I, that I've preached before, but they just they fit tonight, what we're saying. The man came to the disciples of Jesus with a son that, had a, that was demon-possessed. The disciples weren't able to cast him out. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration with James, Peter, and John. And they're, and, and they're exasperated, and Jesus casts out the demon. And of course, we, this is the place where we hear, you know, they, they ask Jesus why we couldn't cast him out. And he said, it's because of your unbelief. You need to do some praying and fasting so your faith will increase. But at this point, the Bible specifically tells us this man brings that son to Jesus. And Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believeth. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And this man says, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You know, we've heard preached that faith cannot exist alongside of doubt. But if you proclaim faith, Jesus will acknowledge that even when you're still struggling with your doubts. Because that's exactly what that man was saying. Is God, I'm choosing to believe, but please help me because I'm struggling in my unbelief. I still got those feelings that are, are begging me to choose not to believe. But I'm choosing to believe. Jesus did not criticize that man for his struggle, but he healed the son instantly because he recognized the man's choice to believe. Hear me tonight. Do not be condemned in your struggle to believe. Do not let the enemy make you think because I'm struggling with getting everything worked out and because I'm struggling with being able to make sense of everything. Don't, make the, don't let the enemy talk you into saying, I just apparently don't believe. You can make the choice to believe tonight and God's going to continue to open up the revelation to you. These altars are open right now. It's not about what you see. It's not about what you feel. It's not about what you think. But it's about what God said. It doesn't matter that I see it this way. God said it. Let's come around the front. I'm inviting every one of us, if we would, to come and seek the face of God right now. God, let revelation right now fall in this place today. I'm praying that the power of your spirit, oh God, would open someone's eyes right now to what you